Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Federal Highway Administration, the use of unmanned aerial systems to remotely collect data for road infrastructure conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star then zero. This conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Rada Mila Kentan. Please go ahead. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on the use of unmanned aerial systems to remotely collect data for road infrastructure, a special project sponsored by the World Road Association, also known as PARC, with support from the Federal Highway Administration, or FHWA. I'm Radha Neelakantan from ICF, and I will be the moderator today. As you just heard, all participants are in listen-only mode, but please feel free to type in your questions or comments at any time in the chat pod located at the bottom left of the screen. The speakers will address all questions at the end of the presentation. We also encourage you to download the World Road Association special report, which is available in the resources pod on the left side of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available after this presentation. Before we begin, we'd like to ask participants to answer the questions that you'll see on your screen now to help us get a sense of who's in the audience today. We're interested in knowing who you are, where you're from, and how many people are listening in today. Great, thank you. It looks like we have a very diverse audience from all around the world and representing lots of different sectors. Um, so with that, I'd like to start the webinar by turning it over to Agnes Velez, who is the program manager in charge of overseeing activities for the U.S. Federal Highway Administration on behalf of the World Road Association. Thank you. Thank you, Rada, and welcome to all our participants. My name is, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Agnes Vélez. Uh, today's webinar marks the launch of the World Road Association Special Project on the use of UAS to remotely collect data for road infrastructure. We will begin with brief remarks by Patrick Malishak, the Secretary General of the World Road Association, and from Mr. Walter Weidelich, the Executive Director of the Federal Highway Administration. Following this, Brian Cawley of the FHWA will give a brief overview of the report, walking through the findings and recommendations. In addition, Brian will also provide a report on one of the case studies about um, how Dar es Salaam in Tanzania used the UAS technology for mapping potential float areas of the city. This will be followed by Paul Wheeler of the Utah Department of Transportation and Jennifer Wells of the Minnesota Department of Transportation who will walk us through projects that their agencies have implemented using drones, which are included in the report as case studies. After the presentations, there will, there will be ample time for Q&A, uh, but if we don't have time to get to all of the questions, we'll get it back to you by email, and we will continue this dialogue after the webinar. We highly encourage attendees to ask questions, as the goal of this webinar is to help agencies understand how they can integrate UAS into their agency's processes. And now I'd like to turn it over to Patrick Malijak, the Secretary General of the World Road Association, and as you heard before, it is also known as PIARC. And PIARC is derived from the original name in English, the Permanent International Association of Road Congresses. So there you go. It's the World Road Association. It is PIARC. Um, you call it as you wish. It's still a wonderful organization. Patrick has been the Secretary General of PIARC since 2016. He started his career at the French National Mapping Institute. He was later involved in road safety and ITS projects and developed his career internationally, notably in Japan and at the European level, when he led the ERA Net Road Project and worked with FERL, um, which is um, an organization of research institutions in Europe. 
Patrick had previously served with the World Road Association as secretary to the Road Safety Technical Committee in the 2004-2007 cycle. With the help of the Secretariat's dedicated team of experts and professionals, Patrick is committed to leading the implementation of the Association's ambitious strategic plan on knowledge production and dissemination to best serve the needs of its 121 member countries and more than 2,000 members. So with that, I leave it, I leave Patrick on the phone. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, founded in 1909 and headquartered in Paris, uh, in France, uh, PIOC, also known as the World Road Association, is a member organization of road administrations, as well as public and private members from more than 120 countries. We come together, my colleagues come together, to share information regarding roadway-oriented research and practices. PIARC is a non-profit, non-political organization, and we hold consultative status to the UN Economic and Social Council. Our vision is that the association will be the world leader in the exchange of knowledge on roads and road transport policy and practices within an integrated sustainable transport context. So that's quite ambitious, and I hope we are reaching those goals. To achieve this vision, PR creates and coordinates technical committees and organizes quadrennial World Road Congresses and Winter World Congresses, as well as about 40 other technical meetings and seminars every year. The organization publishes a bevy of technical reports and online manuals, which are accessible free of charge, and we issue a quarterly magazine called Road Roads. Uh, we operate on a four-year work cycle. Each cycle has a strategic plan, which consists of various strategic themes that the association would focus on for the next four years. Uh, themes are developed in a consultative process, which involves our key delegates, technical committees, and partners who work together to understand which issues are most relevant or challenging to the road transportation community. In the 2016-2019 cycle, which is this current cycle, PIAC has uh, five strategic themes, management and finance, access and mobility, safety, infrastructure, and climate change, environment, and disasters. The strategic themes all have technical committees and task forces to develop work products that facilitate information exchange and technology transfer in their respective areas. More than 50 reports are expected over this cycle and will be presented at the next World War Congress in Abu Dhabi in October 2019. We use regional working groups and special projects to complement this structure of technical committees and task forces. In particular, special projects are meant to explore critical issues that are outside those themes. Those special projects allow for the engagement of consultant teams to develop meaningful products under the direction of our first delegates. This product delivery model is quite similar to the one which is familiar, that you are familiar with in the US, uh, which is the Transportation Research Board's Cooperative Research Program, such as the NCHRP. So this report on drones, which is going to be presented today, was produced this way, thanks to the input and leadership of the USA's FHWA. And Agnes, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. I am now delighted to introduce Mr. Butch Weidelik. He's the Executive Director of the Federal Highway Administration, and in this role, he manages the daily operations of the agency and its personnel, and advises the Administrator, Deputy Administrator, and Senior Officials throughout the U.S. Department of Transportation on the agency's programs and priorities. Mr. Weidelik is also the first delegate to the World Road Association on behalf of the United States. Welcome, Butch. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, first and foremost, I want to welcome everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. And uh, as you know, FHWA's goal is to ensure that our roads and highways continue to be among the safest and most technologically sound in the world. Our membership in PIARC is a way to exchange information with our counterpart agencies on innovative road practices and the most recent technical and policy developments in road transportation around the world. I'd like to talk briefly about how the United States participates in PR. Uh, our membership is a collaborative effort between the Federal Highway Administration and the American Association of State and Highway and Transportation Officials, that's AASHTO, uh, and the Transportation Research Board, TRB. Uh, as FHWA Executive Director, I do. I serve as the, the first delegate and am supported by our Office of International Programs. In the current cycle, I'm also an elected member of the Executive Committee of PIARC and a member of the Strategic Planning Commission. 
Uh, AASHTO is the United States National Committee, and uh, AASHTO coordinates with state, academic, uh, and private sector delegate participation in PARC and helps disseminate the PARC reports and research to the domestic transportation community. Uh, U.S. delegates are members of various technical committees across all the strategic themes that uh, Patrick spoke about uh, a few minutes ago, and they lead the development of several publications and flagship products such as the one you'll be hearing about today. Uh, TRB has a memorandum of understanding with PRC, uh, which calls on the two organizations to work together to further their shared objective of advancing the state of the practice in road transportation. Uh, an example just last week, uh, that's April 9th, uh, we did a joint PR trb webinar on the important topic of road safety and vulnerable road users in low and middle income countries. In the United States, uh, we're well aware of the significant impact of the use of, of UASs and the impacts that they're, they're having and will continue to have in the delivery of road transportation programs. Uh, we're actively working to evaluate and further deploy this technology uh, through four uh, major initiatives. Uh, first, the Federal Highway Administration has brought together lead states that have operational UAS programs along with consultants, contractors, and other federal agencies such as the Federal Aviation Administration uh, to look at areas of common interest and to share knowledge nationally among the public and private sectors. A report based on these outreach activities which summarizes UAS activities and capabilities in the United States is being developed and will be made, made available uh, to all stakeholders. Uh, second, as recently as last week, FXWA participated in a TRB-sponsored domestic scan, scan study on successful approaches for the use of unmanned aerial systems by surface transportation agencies. Uh, this scan examined how agencies and their contractors are using, using UASs to facilitate inspection, uh, inventory, survey, and other operations, and how they're dealing with regulatory and other impediments to UAS deployment. The scan brought together over 30 subject matter experts from 15 states and the Federal Highway Administration. A complete report of this scan will be published by the end of this year. Additionally, Federal Highway Administration will soon start to work on UAS operational, uh, operational technical briefs. These technical briefs will be short but detailed guides to help states and other transportation agencies add new UAS operations to their available capabilities. Uh, the first round of technical briefs will be published over the next year and will focus on construction inspection, supplementing bridge inspection, and emergency response. Uh, finally, FHWA will launch a website to host, to host all things UAS related. Uh, we're working diligently with our partners to have this website up and running by the end of the year. Uh, we'll be sharing the website and all of its products with the World Road Association to disseminate to all of its members. Uh, with all this work going on, we're particularly excited about the special project report, uh, which developed out of a joint proposal that we submitted to PR with the United Kingdom. Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, we've seen a rapid growth in the highway industry's use of this technology, both in construction and maintenance. Uh, what began as high-definition photographs progressed to video, and now with sensors becoming smaller and less expensive, all kinds of data can be collected. Uh, the opportunities for using UASs in planning, design, construction, operations, and maintenance of highways seems endless. Uh, I look forward to this international conversation on this very timely topic, and I want to thank you again for joining us today on this webinar, and let me turn it back over to Agnes. Hey, thanks, Butch. Um, we're ready to begin now, and uh, with the more technical part of our program, I would like to welcome Brian Cawley, who is the FHWA Division Administrator in Wyoming. And Brian led the FHWA's contributions to this report. He will present on the overall findings and recommendations before we move into the case studies. Brian. Thank you, Agnes, and thanks for everybody participating in this. As you've heard, this PIARC special project was motivated by the increasing use of UASs around the world by road agencies and was an effort to capture the lessons and early adopters and provide recommendations for other agencies who are considering or who might benefit from using UASs as part of their agency's operations. The goal is to help PIARC members leverage the experience of others 
to expedite the deployment and mainstreaming of this, this technology. The special project was funded by PyARC with support from Federal Highway, and the report was produced by Renoa Incorporated, a Canadian company focused on geographic analysis and mapping. The report relied on literature reviews and surveys to look at how agencies around the world have been experiencing with UASs to collect road infrastructure data. It delves into 10 different case studies from U.S., Canada, Tanzania, and Iran, showcasing different approaches, approaches and applications for using UAS. If you look on your screen in the Resources tab on your left, you'll see a special project listed, listed available for your download. That's the current special project a report. Overall, the findings within this special project showed that UASs have high value, in particular in four particular areas as identified here. They're low cost. In comparison to our traditional methods of hiring helicopters or airplanes to take imagery, a UAS is relatively low cost in collecting the data that we use today in our transportation industry. They're readily available, the technology. You can buy it off the shelf, and with some minor modifications, you can have it collecting data for you out there. Now, in respect, there are some more uh, complicated UAS configurations that have special sensors and operations, uh, but overall, it's, rel it's readily available to all. There's quick turnaround in operating the UAS and having the data downloaded to assist you in your decision making. And finally, it's remote accessible, or it enhances the safety of our operators as it keeps them out of some of the locations that uh, may be more harmful, harmful for them. Now there are several different types and technologies associated with UASs. Uh, within the United States, the Federal Aviation Administration defines a Undemanned Aerial System, or UAS, as a system which includes the aircraft, which is sometimes called a drone, or an Undemanned Aerial Vehicle. Uh, so you have the aircraft, which is uh, supported by a equipment and operations, such as a ground crew, data telematrics and links, navigations, and payloads and sensors that are collecting the data for you. The payload or UAS of the UAS refers to anything that's carried by the drone. It can be a camera, it can be video cameras, red, blue, green cameras, near infrared, hyperspectrometers, radar, thermal, LIDAR. I, as we're shrinking technology, the payload is, is unlimitless at this time. UASs come in various shapes and sizes also, as you can see on the screen. They range from multi-rotor quadcopter type designs to fixed wings to larger fixed wing devices that you see at the screen. Because the technology is rapidly advancing at this time, the report recommends that agencies evaluate the available technology before each project to select the one that is most suitable for the data collection mechanism and project that they're looking at. Diving into some of the basic components in detail at this time, you start off here in the top right, you have the undemanned aircraft, or you hear them called drones or UAVs. This is your multi-rotor quadcopter, your fixed wing device, your flying device, basically. Then you have the payload that you attach to the bottom of your uh, drone, that this is your data collection mechanism, your camera, or your infrared. This is your device uh, that is collecting data for you during the operation. You have your operators. So this is where you have generally two operators, if not more. You'll have an operator who's operating the aircraft or the drone, and then you'll have an individual who's collecting the data and spotting for the operator. Then you have your different devices that may be occurring at that time. You have your controls that's controlling the aircraft during its operation. And then you have your other tablet type device that is connected with the data being recorded. If 
Finally, you got your different type of transmissions occurring. You have wireless transmitted drones that are transmitting and that are navigated wirelessly as well as are transmitting the data back and forth wirelessly. You also have drones that are operated remotely but collect the data within the drone during operation. And we also have tethered drones at this time that may have a longer flight time or a larger data download, thus requires a direct wire connection to them. And finally, you have your navigation system, whether it's being flown directly by the operator or whether it's being flown by a pre-programmed route associated uh, with the data collection. Some of the high-level uh, high recommendations associated with this special project are first here, uh, where can we use this technology? From the literature review and surveys and case studies conducted, the report concluded that we're using UAS technology for bridge inspection, asset inventory and maintenance operations, pre-construction surveying for both green and brownfield type projects, construction monitoring, asphalt pavement inspection, unpaved gravel road condition monitoring, traffic monitoring, urban mapping, law enforcement and crash scene reconstruction, and avalanche control and monitoring. Uh, the areas that, uh, that are more prone for low and medium, medium income countries include bridge inspection, automated asphalt pavement inspection, unpaid gravel road construct, uh, condition monitoring, and overall urban mapping. Whenever you're using these devices, it's very important that you become familiar with the legislation and regulations associated with using a UAS. You can see on this link, uh, uh, on this web page, there's a link to a website where you can look up different countries' laws, rules, and regulations associated with the use of UAS. Please research this a link as well as your local laws and regulations so you, you understand the rules associated and where and how you can operate the drones collecting the data on your project. Looking more at the United States, the Federal Aviation Administration oversees uh, our airspace and the regulation and assuring the safety of operation within airspace. Some basics to hit on when you're flying UASs for work purposes. You must have a remote pilot airman certificate. You must be 16 years of age or older. There is a licensing process for the operator. The aircraft, based upon its size, must also be registered with the FAA through their online registration site. We also see here with the United States, there are some limitations on where you can fly the device to. It must be flown under 400 feet. It must be within line of sight. We're not able to fly the devices over moving vehicles or people that were not informed about the device. As we look around the world, there are different laws in different countries. If we look at uh, operating a UAS, for instance, in France, Hobbyists, uh, hobbyists are prohibited from using UAS operations over people and prohibited from flying devices over 492 feet in height. In Russia, all devices must be registered that are in excess of a half a pound. In China, China has produced several regulations associated with the flight and operation of UASs that exceed 255 pounds. And in Australia and Mexico, the devices must also be flown within line of sight of operation. There are multiple rules and regulations associated with flying and operating UASs, so please look into both your national as well as your local laws and regulations associated with operating a UAS before you attempt to endeavor with the technology. Another important part that has came out in our special project here is the steps 
by which a new user should consider in adopting this technology. The first steps, or preliminary steps, that one should consider is to familiar, familiarize yourself with the rules governing UAS. Obtain the training and license requirements, as we just discussed. The next one is understand your project. Understand where it's located, your neighbors, the aerospace, uh, airspace requirements, and the type of data you're trying to collect in using the device. Identify suitable UAS technology that will meet your needs in collecting the data. The drone, the data collector, the operator, the spotters, or other, any other preliminary work needed to be done. And finally, finally, select additional equipment or estimate the cost associated with operating the UAS. And compare this cost, the safety, and quality uh, of operating the UAS with other alternatives so you make the best decision and use the technology in the right application for your need. The intermediate steps. After collecting the initial project requirements and your desired outcomes, identify your project team to be used out there with the UAS. Is there a foreman? Is there a journeyman? Is there a apprentice? Get your experienced people and your beginners out there to learn and operate the equipment in a safe manner to collect the data that you desire for your project. Determine a test area. Test the equipment and operators to make sure everything is working and the data is being collected that you desire. Develop communication and emergency plans. Share with project staff. Um, expect the unexpected out there on your project. Set dates and times for the project and negotiate any necessary road closures that may be necessary to collect the data. Coordinate with other project staff on the, on the project to assure everyone knows of your presence and your operation for a safe, successful flight and data collection. Final steps, setting up your equipment. Perform data and communication checks to assure control of your equipment and that your batteries have acceptable power and you're ready to perform a successful flight and data collection process. Set up traffic closures or detours as necessary to assure safety protocols are followed. Perform the flight operation, intermittently checking for data quality on site to avoid having to fly the drone again. Secure your data. Upload it to the server and backups. Make sure you have your data and you have multiple backups in a secure environment so you can use it for success of the project. Then analyze your data to evaluate the data to assure completeness of project requirements. Some challenges or areas for opportunities for uh, advancement in the use of UASs. First one being data storage. The amount of data being collected from UASs is huge. Some organizations have expressed concern with storing this data anticipate, and anticipating more data to be collected in the future. Establish standards and specifications in current guidelines with, within road administrations to assure continual successful flight and operations and use of the drones or UASs. Safety. One of the biggest concerns from regulatory authorities is the safe use of UASs in public areas. Although current generations of UASs have obstacle avoidance systems to prevent crashing in structures, a system that is capable of preventing a crash in a situation where UASs lose control can greatly reduce the risk to the public. Battery life. Some low-end UASs have limited flight time, varying from 15 to 30 minutes. This is reduces efficiency. A great improvement could be an advancement in battery technology to have more sustained, longer data collection periods and flight times. And there may be a point in time where you need to consider a tethered drone where you can continually supply power to the drone and have a direct data download. And it's so important to choose the right equipment for the right project.
And now before we dive into case studies, we'd like to understand how all of you in the audience have been using UASs. If you'd please complete this poll that we have posted this, this time. As we can see, the pull there, uh, the numbers have stopped. Uh, we have great uses, in particular surveying is our most dominant, followed by aerial photography. Thank you very much for completing the poll. As we mentioned earlier, this special project uh, dove into 10 particular case studies. And we've grouped them respectfully within the project. There's five of them that focused on highway construction, inspection, and asset, asset monitoring. In particular, Utah DOT used it for geospatial technology for construction on State Route 20. In a few minutes, we'll have a specific dialogue concerning that one. Uh, Michigan used it for bridge inspection. Uh, Minnesota used it for bridge component inspection. And we uh, have Jennifer on the line who will be uh, uh, providing details concerning that one in a minute. Iran has used it for automated payment, payment uh, uh, asphalt payment inspection. And South Dakota has used it for condition ratings of gravel and unpre on unpaved roads. Next category is we've seen it used all for, also for emergency response or avalanche monitoring controls in the state of Washington. Uh, followed by uh, Dar Salaam using it for mapping and flood prevention. And concluding with uh, some traffic monitoring usage concerning roundabouts and overall surveillance of uh, traffic monitoring. And finally, some law enforcement activity or crash scene reconstruction technology. All these case studies are discussed in detail in the special project report. Now I would like to shift over and talk to you about one particular case study in Dar Salaam, Tanzania. To provide you a little background of, of who Dar Salaam in Tanzania is, uh, we have a map here on the screen that shows you that's located on the eastern coast or Indian side of Africa. It was once the capital of Tanz Tanzania until 1996 when, when Dodam was identified as the new capital. In early 2000s, Dar es Salaam experienced Africa's fastest urbanization rate growth as businesses were opened and, uh, and prospered. With this unplanned growth, 70% of the people live in informal, unplanned settlements with inadequate infrastructure. You can kind of see in these photos here of how populous or urbanized the, uh, the city of Dar Salaam is. In particular, about the project that they used UASs on, the goal of the project for Dar Salaam uh, was to, uh, uh, was to uh, take different imagery of the city and produce a 3D map for the particular city to assist them in flood prevention activities. The project team consisted of the World Bank and Drone Adventures with funding provided by the Swedish Infrastructure Development Agency and the Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction. The team flew two Sensib EB drones during the first mission and three during the second mission. Managing these flights via the drones, eMotion Grand Station software was utilized. The Sensifly eBeam is a fixed-wing drone used to collect RTK and PPK imagery, which produces uh, images down to three inches of accuracy with ground correction aspects applied. I'd like to, at this time, uh, 
Uh, this movie that we're going to present to you uh, does a better job of explaining how the technology used and why UASs were used in the country. Will you please play the movie, Rada? Audio is being presented over your computer screen, computer screen if you'd like to listen to the audio. My name is Frederick Mbuya. I am a consultant for the World Bank, working on open data, drone activities, and various innovations uh, here in Tanzania. It's a very rapidly expanding city. As with many other capital cities, we have a serious problem with, with traffic. We have very, very little data about how to manage traffic. Our road system is not, is not as good as we'd like it to be, and perhaps our driving is not as good as, as we'd like some of the drivers to be as well. If you have to add two hours onto any trip if you're going into the city, it has a huge economic uh, cost. Currently, the most, the most important thing for us is to get as much data as possible, um, which is where the UAVs or the drones come in very, very, very useful. Currently, we're using two types of drones, multicopters and fixed wing. The multicopters can be used to get very quick aerial imagery in the case of a flood or any other emergency where access is restricted but where clear images are desperately needed. These are generally controlled with a traditional remote control and have live video streaming from the drone. Fixed wing drones on the other hand can be used for large scale topographic surveys where the area of interest is identified beforehand and the drone software determines the necessary flight plan and conducts the survey autonomously. What we have to understand is the technology is not what's really great and cool about them. What's really great and cool about them is the data which we can get out of them. So when you imagine that with a sub $2,000 device you are now getting a data set worth $50,000 and putting it in the hands of city planners. Thank you. I noticed uh, looking at the chat pod, there were a few people having some technical difficulties seeing the movie. Uh, however, within the presentation, you'll see where it is posted on the YouTube site. Uh, the World Bank has been assisting researching the use of UASs in Dar Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, the me movie presented their current activities there. Uh, there's also a report written concerning this at the case study uh, hyperlink on the slide also, uh, tie, and it'll take you to a website that's called Drones and Humanitarian Actions. Uh, you'll find this particular example, as well as there are many other examples there of where UAS technology has assisted the world in humanitarian actions. Looking now more specifically at the Tanzanian example, the project flew two missions with the goal of generating high-resolution uh, imagery of a 55-mile-square, 55, uh, 55 square mile area. 
The team flew two Sensa BEB drones during the first mission and three during the second, managing these flights via the drone's eMotion Grand Station software. A schoolyard was used for landing and takeoff purposes. Flying many dr flights was necessary to get the data for the whole city, but then required additional work to adjust for variances in lighting afterwards. The drones collected over 20,000 aerial images, which were then used to produce a 3D elevation model. This drone divide elevation model produced using InSafe software shows the varying vulnerability of buildings and roads to flooding in Dar Salaam, uh, Tandale Ward. You can see here in this particular image, this is a flood analysis using the 3D model that was produced by the drone's aerial photography. The green are the safe areas versus all the red spots are areas of the city which are prone to potential flooding and additional infrastructure activities need to occur there. One of the biggest challenges was keeping track of the drones collected data for the team's imaging process work. Local leaders were very supportive and enthusiastic in the use of this technology. The data set the mission produced was huge and detailed and now providing a great value to many organizations and government departments. The main orthophoto, uh, orthophotography the photo data produced is already being used for roof print digitization and the World Bank is planning to use the digital model for inundation mapping. The images captured in this project have already contributed to improve map detail of the city and are being used as part of the Mission Maps Project, which compiles geographic information for first responders. Generally, this mission provided a positive affirmation that fixed-wing UASs can be used for collecting valuable orthoimagery. With that said, I'm going to turn the time back over to Agnes for the additional case studies. Agnes? Thank you so much, Brian. Now, please allow me to introduce Paul Wheeler from the Utah Department of Transportation, who will be speaking on that organization's use of UAS to support a study of real-world applications of UAS and other geospatial monitoring and analysis technologies. Paul is part of the technology advancement team serving as the lead UAS coordinator at the Utah Department of Transportation. He has worked in many capacities within <coughs> UDOT for the past 20 years as Survey Technology Advisor, lead of the 3D Visualization Group, CAT Support Specialist, and Construction Surveyor. Paul is an instrument-rated private pilot and is working on fostering innovation through the use of unmanned aerial aircraft systems. Paul, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Agnes. So I'd like to thank you guys for the opportunity to kind of share our use of geospatial technology for design and construction on our State Route 20 project. To give you a little background on this, this was our first project to have the 3D model be advertised as the legal document in lieu of traditional plan sheets. Uh, the scope of this project was really to add some climbing lanes to a steep hillside with uh, some significant complexity in there. And for this project, we really wanted to, for it to be an innovative pilot where we could evaluate changes to a lot of our processes in order to see what provided the most value and what really made the most sense to implement in our future projects. So how this all started was uh, we really looked at and thought about our processes and looked at areas where we could potentially improve. What we found was that our traditional process of creating 2D plan sheets was kind of the bottleneck that we had. We were designing in 3D and then creating all that effort there, then turning it into a 2D plan sheet with all the callouts. Then we'd turn that 2D plan sheet over to the contractor, which was scanning those 2D plan sheets and then recreating a 3D model from that for use in their automated machine guidance equipment. And what we really looked at and thought was, how can we improve this process? What would really happen if we eliminated the paper plan set? and used a 3D model for advertisement instead. It seemed kind of silly that we're creating a 3D model and converting it to 2D, and then they're taking that and making it 3D. Why don't we just provide that 3D model in the beginning? 
and see what happens. And that's kind of what this project sought out to accomplish, in addition to utilizing some other innovative technologies, such as uh, UAS. So due to the unique innovations and potential challenges associated with this project, it was decided to use CMGC on the job. And then some of the applications on the project were, uh, let me switch to this slide for you. So some of those uh, unique innovations and potential challenges associated with the project was decided to use CMGC. And uh, the applications on it was high density topographic mapping. And the reason we needed to do that is we figured if we need to design off a 3D model, that's going to make so we need a lot more detailed, higher quality topo map for that. And then also refine 3D modeling to support AMG efforts. So before they just take the 3D model so far, and then they'd spend the majority of the time creating a 2D plan sheet. So we figured if we're not creating those plan sheets, let's take that time and make a more refined 3D model that really helps the contractor with what they need to actually build it. And we wanted to utilize new methods and tools for the calculation of quantities. And with AMG, we wanted to test having less stakes in the field. So if the machines are telling them what they need to do, we may not need as many stakes in the field. But in order to do that, we need to have a way for our inspection team to still inspect that and have a, a real-time verification process for those inspection teams. And then with that, we wanted to do periodic progress monitoring. And in the end, we really wanted a detailed as-built model to utilize in the future and create and test the data for inclusion in and living as built that changes over time with that roadway. So with the goals we had for this project, we really needed to have good organization processes and documentation in order to determine what worked well and what didn't and explore why it was successful or not. So we broke down our flights into major project tasks. And for these uh, major project tasks, uh, we wanted to investigate the use of small unmanned aerial systems to collect that data on the project to determine the quality of the data in addition to what we could really use it for and find out all those things that uh, it would be used, useful for in addition to just uh, the initial things that you think of like as aerial photography. So in addition to the UAS, we kind of changed our processes to have GPS ground rovers that were used for real-time verification and measurement to give quick response to verify the grade quality against a 3D model instead of the paper plan sets. And uh, for the flights here, uh, we broke it down into kind of three phases. We had our pre-mission, our mission, and our post-mission phases. The, the pre-mission phase, I won't kind of go over all these, but it basically included everything from developing a project plan setting control and scheduling the data collection. Uh, our mission steps for it included setting up a work zone, equipment, and then flying the small UAS to collect the data. And then our post-mission steps included everything from reviewing the data, identifying gaps that we may have and the other issues, and then transferring that data to secondary locations for, for, safe keep, for safekeeping. The next slides I'll go into kind of a little more detail onto what methods were used for, for the quantities that we did out there. So for the measurements of quantities and real-time monitoring, we used a hybrid approach. And what I mean by hybrid approach is we use multiple technologies. So we changed our processes to have the contractor provide a GPS rover to be used and checked out by our inspection team. And the contractor also provided the training to the inspection team on how to use the rovers. We found it's, it's just kind of hard for us to always purchase brand new equipment. And with the contractor providing that equipment and then us using our 3D model, we're able to have that independent verification, yet we could have the newest technology out there instead of trying to, to keep a fleet of equipment on our own, which is hard to keep updated. So with less, less stakes on that project, and then the 3D model as a legal document, they really didn't have plan sheets like they traditionally would have. So we really needed to supplement them with some new tools to be able to accomplish their job properly. And this included some tablets to view the 3D model, and then also those GPS rovers to verify the grade. A test with the rovers proved to be very successful and was really welcomed by our inspection teams. It gave them just another tool to use that really helped them to identify what was going on out there on the job. It allowed them easy access to determine the status at any time with less stakes out in the field. And they also documented all those shots they took so we could later use them to verify quantities that were captured with remote sensing technologies. So for the site monitoring, it was performed periodically 
using UAS throughout the job to see what has really changed over time. It, the UAS kind of gave the team an overall better picture of the progress of the job with more detail than was ever achieved previously that we've had on any of our jobs. And having that updated imagery was just an excellent tool that we found we could use for many purposes, not just for progress monitoring, but also for the documentation and a picture in time should any event arise where we might need that imagery, such as if there was something that happened later on. We didn't know what had changed. We could go back and look at that documentation, that really high detailed aerial photography and see what those things were. For our quantities, they were measured throughout the job using GPS and UAS technology. Not only did they test those two technologies, they were also testing using their iPad to see if it was for sufficient to do some of their measuring tasks on there as well. So we're trying to use as many tools as we possibly could because it was all new for a lot of these inspectors to have a full digital workflow on this job. And then our UAS was used for the final quantity and it was compared to our design quantity, and then also those GPS quantities that were taken throughout the job, kind of for a QC on that. Another use that was utilized from the, the detailed UAS data was uh, the slope analysis. And as you can kind of see in this picture here, this is actually a point cloud that was taken with the UAS. And you can see the detail of that, all those little points in there. And it looks almost like a photo, but it's actually a, a point cloud where every point has a coordinate on it. So for that, by utilizing Guard or UAS, not only did they receive really high resolution—I can't talk—high resolution imagery, they also processed the data using the photogrammetry software to get that point cloud to deliverable that you see here. And they used that point cloud data and were able to determine exactly where the slopes were at, whether they were built to that 3D model that we had, or if they deviated at all. And they could get a detailed model that would be used to calculate how much fill and cut was added for the project. They could then take those two surfaces, the original 3D model and the new surface model from the UAS, and see where they deviated and why. They could see exactly what was changed in the field and if it was approved or not. This technology just seemed so useful for us. It was extremely valuable for this use to have the designers be able to look at that, the contractor to be able to look at, and have a really educated decision on if this was built to how we wanted it out there. So once the project was completed, we required a detailed 3D as-built for the project. And for this as-built model, so the contractor used unmanned aircraft and then also LIDAR for the final as-built model, kind of a, a hybrid approach to combine those best technologies. So with the, the UAS, we didn't quite get enough accuracy of what we wanted on the roadway. So what was done was he would actually scan the roadway with the LIDAR and then we'd fly the area and then he'd combine those two different technologies together. So static LIDAR on the roadway, UAV on the softscapes, and then used another software platform to use the, the UAS aerial imagery for a colorization of that LIDAR point cloud so everything matched. So by doing that, normally it'd take a lot more time when they did LIDAR on the roadway to wait for it to take those photos. But then the photos wouldn't match what was taken on the aerial imagery by the unmanned aircraft. So by using that aerial imagery taken by the UAS and then combining that with the LIDAR, everything matched really well as far as the colorization. And what was really interesting to us is the contractor reported to attaining about 3 hundredths to 4 hundredths of a foot accuracy by utilizing both of these technologies combined. So we got a lot more detail and a lot more accuracy than we've ever been able to achieve before. In fact, it was so detailed of a model, it was questioned if it was almost too much detail. And with this model, uh, in the past, uh, a lot of our as-builds, we'd either not get them or they'd go into a box, and some people really wondered what, what value it had just sitting in a box. So what our goal was is, okay, we really want an as-built because we want to know what's going on on all of our projects. We spent a lot of money. We ended up doing mobile LIDAR in every one of our state highways because we didn't know what all assets we had on the road. So we wanted to continue this because we were continuing it every other year and then ch seeing what had changed from scan to scan. So we decided, wait a minute, we're doing these projects. Why don't we take this data from our as-built and then put it back into this database? So our goal really was for a living as-built moving forward on all our projects and then also to capture not just the as-built above ground, but underground, so we had a utility database as well. 
And that way we could see what changed, what assets was out there, and we wouldn't have to drive it every two years. We could just update it as a project went, put that data into our database, and then as somebody from maintenance went out, if they fixed a sign, they could update the database too. And that's what we're working on right now is to have a real living as-built so we know what assets and everything that's out there on our roadway. We did find some difficulties out here, especially at this high density point clouds. And some of it is computers. Some of our computers weren't able to handle that large of a data set. And not only that, but what, sometimes you give the designers a point cloud, this wonderful data, but they didn't know how to use it. So there's some education that had to be done to show them what you could do with the point cloud and how good of detail and data it really was compared to some of our traditional methods. A surveyor would pretty much just get your brake lines and areas, but you want to get all those little finite details that you always get with a point cloud. So for this final slide, I'd like to kind of discuss our project outcomes, uh, give you guys those numbers that you want to see, and what did using this technology and changes in the process really do for us on this project. So we, uh, we had someone document the project from the beginning to the end, and the study kind of examines all phases of the project, including our initial scoping all the way through the analysis of the data from UAS and then other geospatial tools. So in total, using UAS technology showed improved efficiency, a lot of cost effectiveness when compared to alternative methods. For the overall project, we got a savings of 2.58%, which equated to about $82,672. And in addition to this savings, talking to our inspection team, our resident engineer actually seen, he equates a 45% increase in productivity from his staff by utilizing these new tools. So part of that wasn't all just the UAS, but we also implementing that digital workflow. Uh, we ended up using Masterworks, those GPS rovers, UAS, AMG, all these new tools is where he's seeing that 45% increase in productivity with his team. And while this paints a beautiful picture of what we achieved and we had great success, in fact, they finished 25 days ahead of schedule, but not everything turned out good. In fact, what happened is in the beginning, we found out that a topographic surface, that really detailed one they did with LIDAR, wasn't cleaned good enough for the vegetation. So all this was done, it was advertised, and then we found out the model didn't meet the needs of what the contractor needed. So we ended up having to go out and resurvey that, fix the data that was bad. And what we actually found was even though this was a potential problem, by not having a plan set, we didn't have to recreate all those plan sheets. We just reran the modeler, created a new 3D model right on the fly. It was very easy to do, had a new model in hand for the contract to use, and we really turned that con into a pro by doing those and still finished with 25 days ahead of schedule, still had savings cost even though we had problems, really turned those cons into positives, and uh, we had a great outcome as far as this goes. And uh, with that, uh, I'll have some questions at the end if you have any questions about that. And with that, I'll turn the time back to Agnes to introduce our next exciting presentation. Thank you so much, Paul. It, it was exciting. It's good that you're documenting uh, cost savings and uh, productivity. That's always um, a big question here in the States, and I'm sure it's the same for our international partners. Um, we're ready to move on to our next case study. And uh, please allow me to introduce Jennifer Wells. She is from the Minnesota Department of Transportation, and we'll be talking about the, US, the use of UAS for bridge component inspection. Jennifer is a state bridge inspection engineer and has been with uh, Minnesota DOT for the past 17 years, the last 12 in fracture critical bridge inspection, and five years in bridge design and bridge standards. Jennifer has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Michigan Tech University and a master's from the University of Minnesota. She's a licensed civil engineer, NBIS team leader, Pratt Level 1 rope access technician, and lead investigator on uh, Minnesota drone research for bridges. Welcome to, uh, to our webinar, Jennifer, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about what we've been doing in Minnesota in regards to using drones for bridge inspection. Let me get my mouse over here. Okay. 
So the goal of this project was to look at different drones for their effectiveness compared to other access methods we traditionally use in Minnesota for improving our inspections and use it as a tool for interim or special inspections, including up to emergency response type inspections. Um, we get a lot of bridge hits here in the metropolitan area, so um, it'd be nice to be able to fly those at night as well. Uh, the study was conducted by the state uh, in conjunction with Collins Engineering and support from the FHWA since uh, April of 2015. In the beginning, we kept our bridge selection uh, rural versus urban, so we, we tried to stay out of the public eye for the most part. We did a variety of uh, different bridge sizes, uh, bridge locations. We needed owner cooperation, um, but we wanted to limit public contact in the beginning because we didn't real, really know how the public would react to this at first. Um, so up to date, we are currently ending phase three, as you can see in the timeline there on the slide. And that report should be published within a few weeks. By June for sure, I'm actually in the process of reviewing it, uh, part of it right now. And we were just funded for a phase four implementation project with the Metro District that's going to begin this summer. <clears throat> So our project scope um, was conducted over multiple phases, and, which was a really great option for us. We have a governor that even though at the time in 2015, he was very uh, wary of drones, drone usage, mostly in regards to privacy issues. So even before we were even going to start the project, um, we had to get the governor's permission. Um, at first we thought, okay, we have some end of the year money to use up. Let's, we're, we were both interested in drones, me and um, Collins Engineering, the consultant that I work with on a number of different projects. So what we thought was gonna be a small project just to look at some flying toy to help us with the, get better pictures on a bridge uh, turned out to be a lot more involved than we had initially thought. Our Office of Aeronautics wasn't prepared for that yet. So they came in and said, wait a second, slow down everybody. <laughs> um, but we were able to get all of the permissions through and move forward with our project and have it completed by June 30th of 2015. Um, so on the slide here it says, how we were going to look at things. The first part of the project was really looking at what drone types could we use, which ones would work possibly on bridges. Um, every report that we have done in regards to the research is available on the research office's website for MnDOT, and you can find them there. So our current access methods in Minnesota, we own a snooper fleet of six underbridge inspection vehicles, which we call snoopers, and that's in the top photo right there. We um, are on the way of getting a seventh. Uh, it is going to be delivered this June. It's a first of its kind snooper that can, has an extendable boom that can reach over large width sidewalks. So we have a multiple snooper type of trucks, different lengths. We also have aerial work platforms. We also access bridges via rope access, structure climbing, ladders, whatever we can do or take. I, being a team leader myself or inspector, for those of you um, not from the US, uh, bridge inspector, I do operate these machines. I do rope access. Um, it's part of my job and I love it. That's the best part of my job, actually, I love it. Uh, as far as what the national bridge inspection standards in the U.S. require and what the state requires in regards to inspection, hands-on versus non-hands-on, the only requirement for hands-on is for fracture critical steel elements. So that's any element that is steel whose fracture or uh, failure could cause a partial or total collapse of the structure as a whole. Those do need to be inspected within arm's reach of an inspector. However, those are very few and far between for inspections. We only have so many of them in the state. And the most of our bread and butter inspections are 
routines, so your annuals or every 24-month inspection. Those do not need to be hands-on, and they can be accessed anyway by binoculars or through cameras. That is the most what we have for our inspections. My unit also does all of the non-destructive testing measurements. So we do ultrasonic thickness testing, magnetic particle testing. So far, drones can't do that yet, but I know vendors have been asking, what do you need these drones to do? And I'm sure it won't be long before they can do that as well. Um, looking at the different phase technology that we use, so in phase one, there wasn't an inspection-specific drone available to us at that time. So we used the Arian Sky Ranger, which is a military grade drone. It's about $150,000. It's a very robust drone. It worked really well in our weather conditions here. But as you can see on the slide there, the camera is underneath the drone, so it can't look up. It also cannot be operated without GPS. So once we tried to fly under the bridge, the drone would lose the GPS signal, so it would automatically fly back to its home base. So we were only able to get really good side views and somewhat underneath the bridge. But the photo, video, and thermal imaging capabilities were, were really great on this drone. During this time, as we were moving into phase two, because our, our success with that first phase, even though it was short-lived, um, was so great, you know, we thought, okay, this drone isn't quite what we need, but um, maybe there's some other drones out there, and that's where SenseFly and Flyability came in. They were um, inspection-specific drones, just new to the market. Uh, I believe we actually were using SenseFly's prototype for our Phase II um, research project at the time, as they weren't quite ready to market yet. So they allowed us to use that drone. That's the Bumblebee-looking drone up at the top. This one is very stable even though it only weighs about four pounds. It's inspection specific. It has ultrasonic sensors all around the drone to detect objects so that if you set it at a certain distance, whatever the pilot does, the drone won't go that into that distance. It also has a camera that's capable of looking up and it can also be flied manually without GPS so it can fly under bridge decks. It also has infrared camera on it. Um, although this drone worked really well for us, um, it, we didn't want to get it too close into the bridge. Um, it is still quite a large drone. But there was a sister company in Switzerland called Flyability, which has that drone there in the cage. And this is a very light drone as well, too. But this one was made specifically for confined space. And actually, we did buy this drone here in the metro dis district this last year, which is what we're starting phase four with. So just to go over some of the uh, bridges we looked at briefly to show you what we've done. Um, in our phase one with the Arian Sky Ranger drone, this is just showing a bridge that we looked at. It's a railroad bridge. It's only able to be inspected by rope access as this is a very active track. Um, this is over the St. Croix River just north of the Stillwater. Most people don't even know this exists. But the drone was able to get really close up images of the pinned connections. This was in the National Park Service, so we did not have authorization to fly um, off the National Park Service land. We didn't know this till last minute, so we basically, I said, let's run a pontoon or something. Maybe let's fly off of the, let's launch off the pontoon in the river, and they were fine with that. So that worked out good. So what we do in Minnesota, as well, if I didn't mention, is in order to do any project, we have to go through our Office of Aeronautics. Now, they, are, they hold the drone program as far as um, authorizations. Um, they work with legal teams, and we also um, get authorization from every uh, bridge owner or property, property owner within the vicinity of a project we're doing right now. We also did, um, back on this slide, we also did a comparison of what the inspection report said compared to what the inspectors saw and then what the, the images from the drone saw. With the phase two, uh, we used the SenseFly drone. It was called the Exom at the time, but now it's called the Elbrus. With this one, we did a cost analysis. We were able to do mapping missions. 
We incorporated this into an actual inspection. And we also wanted to test the thermal imaging camera on it. We have our own handheld FLIR cameras, and we wanted to see how that compared to what the drone's camera showed. And we wanted to test out this bumblebee drone in a confined space as well. These pictures here are showing, um, this was a bridge closed between Minnesota and North Dakota. It's a county road. The bridge was closed due to deck issues. So deck delaminations, well, basically there were holes in the deck. Um, but we wanted to see what the drone would do. And um, we also did a deck chain drag to compare all three of them uh, side by side. So you can see this is a, a photo from the drone with its infrared. And we also took the data from the drone to develop a 3D point cloud of the bridge. And that was done with software called PIX4D. This was a large culvert in St. Paul that we tried to use the drone in. It worked well, uh, although because of the propellers, they're a little bit larger in size. They did uh, stir up a lot of dirt and debris in there. But it did fly through there just fine. That drone and also the cage drone by flyability have LED lighting around it too, so they work well in dark conditions. So with phase three, we more focused on, now that we, under part 107, have pilot licenses and we are comfortable with flying and with the drones that we have, this was more focused on using a confined space drone and mapping and what are we doing with this data and trying out all different types of bridges, flying much, as much as possible. So we went all over the state, all different kinds of bridges, um, did a, a lot of quality and safety improvements, and did a lot more with the data. And our goal here with this was trying to identify, are we going to implement this full time and what will be the sustainable future funding for this? And the emphasis was obviously on data presentation analysis that we're getting. So here are some of the images that we got. This is from into PIX4D here. And this is an image of a pier from the drone data of what the drone caught from the Elbrus, actually. And as you can see in the slide here, you can edit the images within the software to pinpoint deficiencies. PIX4D also allows you to do measurements as well. So like here on this image, you have, this is our historic stone arch bridge in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And there's some shaded areas in there, and that's pointing out some deficiencies. And this, and what's nice about PIX4D is they have a cloud availability. So my consultant is able to share this data file with me via a link. And I can go into it, and I can do measurements from that link as well. And it's all secure. This scan was done in conjunction, conjunction with a Blueview scan, underwater scan and the Elbrus drone. So we could get an underwater view plus an um, above water view of the pier and what the scour issues were in, regard, in regards to that. Consultant, we also looked at corridor mapping and, and looking at signs along a corridor. As you can see here, you got an outward view of the roadway, but you can pinpoint in close to see where that sign is. So this is good for overhead sign inventory as well. We also looked at um, how well the drone and the PIX4D software could do use, doing pond volume calculations. And this is a 3D model of a said pond that was taken. And we were able to put the data into PIX4D from the drone and able to do pond volume calculations with it. And from that, a resulting topo map. So what we're going to anticipate doing in phase four, like I said, we bought the flyability drone within the cage. In our metropolitan area, and I'm sure with a lot of other places, have similar issues. We have issues with access. Due to traffic, we are not given lane closures a lot in the metropolitan area. And as a result, our inspection data is not very accurate um, because the inspectors aren't getting up to these high wall abutments, these piers within the traffic areas very often or if at all. So what happens then is we have scope creep. Comes time to rehab a bridge, 
the consultant gets out there, what we initially scoped as part of from the inspection data we originally have wasn't what they find in the field. It's a lot worse than that what we were find what we were stating on the inspection reports. So um, projects have gone up by millions of dollars, and that is not a good thing. Legislators don't like that. So this is giving us good access. The cage drone will allow us to get up close and personal with the bridges. Um, with the cage, we can fly right up inside uh, between beams. Um, roll along abutments and piers and get the information that the inspector needs. And if they see something that needs further investigation by getting access, then at that time we can get a lift out there and basically have proof that we need to, to traffic management. So basically we're um, using Metro District here as our prototype, our guinea pig prototype for um, implementation of the program as a whole. Ultimately, what we're going to do is have a drone fleet <clears throat> through my group at the Central Bridge Office, where we'll be the statewide experts for drones and bridge inspection, and help other agencies within the state either drone bridges or develop their own inspection program as well with drones. So we're going to be basically the tie between um, them and aeronautics office. So we'll be the experts in that. And we do also plan to have consultants on board. I've already put, um, we have a thing called an augmented staffing contract availability in Minnesota. So I'm able to put a contract or a consultant on staff for a certain number of years for a certain dollar amount so I can get access to them whenever I need work done for whatever reason in bridge inspection. And I can do a direct select in regards to that. So that's our plan is to implement um, drones and bridge inspection statewide. Um, and it's going to be a centralized expertise helping other agencies, but also we'll be supplementing with consultant forces as well. Mainly that's for me for not wanting to do all the, the grunt work that I don't like, like writing manuals and things like that. I'll review them, but I would rather have uh, somebody do the writing because this is only a small portion of my job. I do a lot of other things. Um, these are the conclusions. We did a cost comparison analysis. It was We were showing that we had over 60% cost savings and a 30% time savings. With those kind of numbers, it was a slam dunk for getting more funding on this. Um, this drones have been taking off, no pun intended, ha ha, <laughs> um, that you know, legislators and public alike are really excited about this. It's gaining a lot of momentum with that. And we've had a really good public response. Um, we've been very open and transparent with the public about what we're doing. We release a, mid, a media blast every time we go out and do anything with a drone. And the public has been very responsive and positive, which has been really nice. Anything that can save money and involves technology, they've been all for. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much, Jennifer. What a very um, thorough presentation you and Paul both have given us uh, plenty of examples on how um, a good use of UASs can be of um, service to the transportation, the road transportation community. I know that some of our um, uh, participants have been making questions through the chat pod, and I saw Paul has been answering many of them. But I also know that some of the questions, particularly in that, this last part of the, of the program, uh, have not been answered. So I'm going to now ask Rada to um, lead this uh, last portion of our presentation, this Q&A session. Rada? Thanks, Agnes. And thanks to all the presenters. It was a really interesting uh, webinar so far. So, um, there's been a lot of interaction in the chat thread. Um, I'm going to get to some of the questions that haven't been answered. And I'll start with the very last one because I think it's very relevant. Um, so to all of the presenters, we want to understand a little bit more about how the regulations and whether the regulations have limited what you're able to do with your drones. Do you want us to yeah, answer yeah. voice like or type it in? Yeah. No, 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 oh. answer. Oh, okay. This is Jennifer from Minnesota. Um, as far as we're, our limitations, we haven't had a whole lot except for what the rules um, have stated for 
U.S., um, basically we can't, unless we get a certificate of authorization or a COA to get waivers or a waiver or restrictions lifted, we basically can't fly at night. We have to fly under 400 feet or less. We have to be within uh, visual sight of the drone. Can't fly over moving traffic. But these are some things that we can get waivers on. And from what I hear from our aeronautics office is that if we get a COA, um, the FAA will be more more uh, lenient or, or willing to give waivers off of restrictions to um, government agencies. So we'll have a lot more freedom to fly, especially like in emergency situations than at night. Yeah, that's for oh, Utah. You? Yeah, for Utah, it's uh, definitely posed some limitations on us, especially with restricted airspace. Luckily, the land system is coming out, which will give us instant authorization. And the problems we've had is sometimes it can take up to 90 days to get a waiver in order to find some restricted airspace. So the problem comes if you don't have 90 days, and sometimes that does happen. Uh, the limitation of flying over traffic is uh, an issue as well. We typically will fly offset from the road, and with the overlap that we do, we're able to to achieve great results still, but it would be nice when you have crossroads so you don't have to land and then move over the road and then fly again. So those are some of the, the issues that we have. Uh, the FAA is aware of some of the limitations we have, and luckily the FHWA and FAA and the state DOTs are all working together to try and come up with some new rule sets that uh, work great with safety and then also helps with some of those limitations that we have. Uh, night ops are another issue that uh, can be an issue, but is Jennifer stated, you can get a, a COA to fly at night, too, and then also beyond visual line of sight, too. But uh, with the integration pilot program that's coming up, uh, a lot of the states have put in to participate in that. They haven't announced who those leads are yet, uh, so there's some anticipation coming for that. We've, we're hoping to uh, possibly be one of those leads as well and, and to test some of these areas and do it like a scientific experiment and see what works well, what doesn't to uh, help shape and, and kind of craft those upcoming rules. Great. So that kind of goes back to what Brian was saying earlier, that the rules are constantly developing. And so we need to always be aware of what the current um, legislative or regulatory uh, environment is. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned at the beginning of your project that um, there were some privacy concerns, but you said at the end of your presentation that the public was very enthusiastic about the use of drones. Can you talk a little bit about how you um, manage the privacy concerns? Yeah, the privacy concerns in the beginning were basically because of the, the governor was wary about issues in regards to that and how we address that. Um, even though the public is very responsive, we still want to be <clears throat> very transparent with what we're doing and not hiding anything because this is um, this program's really starting to take off, and we don't want to ruin it for people by having some something happen. So we want to make sure we're following the rules and being transparent with the public. So what we do in regards to that is we file a flight safety plan for every uh, mission with our aeronautics office and we address privacy in that area. We also get written authorizations from any bridge owner or entity that's in the vicinity if we're going to be on their property at all before we even do the flight. That way we have written, we can show written consent um, in case any legal matters may come up or anything like that. But for the most part, when we talk to somebody, can we fly on your property, they're like, yeah, okay. They're usually not really interested at all. <laughs> unless they want to come see the drone themselves. But other than that, um, yeah, it's been really good. Okay, great. Um, there were a couple of technical questions uh, for Paul and for Jennifer. I'll start with you, Jennifer, uh, since you're on the line right now. Um, what uh, can, They wanted to know, can a drone be used to determine the scour depth of a bridge? I don't know, maybe Paul can answer more to that. but. Um, they were using a Blu-ray scan um, in conjunction with the drone on top, so I'm not sure how they were able to do that. But I knew, I do know from being at drone conferences in the last year that there is uh, a drone being produced that can fly in the air and also swim under the water. Um, so who knows what it's going to be able to do by then. I think mostly it's going to be if whatever data you can get the after-effects software is going to be able to do with the measurements. 
Okay, great. Um, Brian, uh, there was a question about um, breakthroughs in improving battery life and longer flying duration. Do you know of anything that's in the, in the pipeline? I, I'm sorry, at this point in time, I don't know of anything in the pipeline. When it has been necessary, such as uh, special monitoring during special events, and they need additional time or additional data collection, uh, typically they have resorted to tethered drones to monitor the situation and have a longer life. Okay. Yeah, if I could Thank add you. something on there as well, they do have some sure. fixed wing UAS out there that will fly for 60 minutes. So you can get a lot of mapping done in that time on that battery life. So it's using the traditional batteries, but uh, due to less drag and, and other items, your fixed wings can, can attain a lot better for as far as battery life goes and, and getting a bigger area flown where you, obviously your quadcopters, you get between 20 to 30 minutes depending on the aircraft. Thanks, Paul. Um, we had a question for you. I know that you uh, You've answered a lot of questions in the chat thread, um, but there was a specific question about emergency relief for federally owned roads. Um, and the participant was asking whether the data that you get from your drones can be downloaded into the new FHWA Mobile Solutions for Asset Reporting system. Do you know? You know, I am not sure, to be honest with that. Uh, we do have all of our data publicly available. In fact, all the imagery that not only we fly as a DOT, but all of our consultants and contractors fly, if it's a map, we're actually uploading that into a GIS database with updated imagery that's typically about one inch per pixel ground sampling distance. So that is something we're doing with that. But as far as into that federal database, I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that. Is that a publicly available GIS database? It will be, yes. Yeah, I don't okay. think we have it out there on our website now, but uh, it's definitely for the public. We, we try to be transparent with all our data that we have here. And um, Jennifer, what are you, how are you managing data in Minnesota? Well, uh, as most of you probably know on this webinar that uh, the drones can get quite a bit of data. What we're doing right now, um, what my consultant did for the data that they've been doing for our research is they bought a separate server completely just for drone data. And what we've done here now for in the metro district is we are using external hard drives to keep our drone data on because our, I don't know if everybody else's state DOT is like this, but our servers are packed to the limit already. So mm -hmm. we are, we're trying to keep that separate, but from what we've, um, what we've learned with using PIX4D is that we're able to, you know, share the drone data uh, via a web link that's in the cloud. And we store all of our inspection data <coughs> in the cloud, too, on our servers from Bentley. So um, I'm investigating with them how we can be able to add that web link to each bridge inspection report so, and so people can click on the link and go to that drone data as well. Currently, our, our website for that, our SIMS application, is, is um, only to us. It's not publicly made available unless you go just to the, pond, the um, regular inspection data. So, but I am going to be in the process of developing a drone-specific bridge inspection web page for our DOT this year so that we can have and show all these links to share this data with um, all the public, except for, of course, our uh, national security bridges. Right. Well, that sounds really exciting. It sounds exactly what Brian was saying, that data is, is one of the big challenges, and everybody seems to be dealing with it separately. And so this is a good time for people to come together and come up with standards and processes. Um, so uh, it's 12.30. Um, I think we've had a really wonderful webinar. It's very informative. Um, for anyone who's still online, we'd like to ask you to answer a couple of questions just so that we can get your feedback. Um, and we also have all the contact information for the presenters, so you can feel free to email them. Um, we will be recording the webinar and sending out the recording and the slides uh, shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes our conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T teleconference service. You may now disconnect.